we're talking about light and lenses. So first I'm going to start off with light and the three essential things about light, which is quality, direction, and amount. So the big thing with quality is whether it's a very direct light or if it's diffuse light. Now direct, you can kind of think of the sun on a clear day where it's just a very bright stream. Diffuse is when there's something that the sun is coming through, such as clouds or fog, which makes the light uh, scatter around and come off as a lot more softer. Okay, so direct natural light is unfiltered, unblocked sunlight. And one way to really tell that it's direct light is that it has very strong shadows, as in the line where the shadow and the light is is very, uh, very delineated. You definitely see a line between the shadow and light. It has really great and strong contrast. Now diffuse light, like I said, is light that's passing through something that's scattering it about, such as fog, um, an overcast day where there's a bunch of clouds. And that's for outdoors. When we're talking about artificial light, like in a studio, things like a flash or a direct bulb will have a very strong light. But when you get a diffuse light in the studio, it's because you're using something like an umbrella, and that's doing the same thing as a cloud. It's scattering the light around. So if we look at the two photos here in this example, you can see that this first photo is has very direct light. If you look at the shadows here and in the grass and such, um, they're not soft shadows, they're hard shadows. If you look back here in the mountains, it's not very soft, it's pretty hard. In comparison to this photo that's in a forest where there's a lot of mist, the light is being diffused by the mist, by the trees also, and there's still shadow. You can see shadow right here, but there's not a really, really strong line between the light side and the shadow side. We're going to look at some more examples now. So here are some portraits taken with very uh, direct light, and it's harsher. You could see right here this line that delineates between the shadow back here and the light that's shining on her. Whereas this portrait, there's still shadow on her face. There's shadow over here. Without shadows, we wouldn't be able to see the three-dimensionality of her face. But it's very soft. There isn't the direct line that you can see right here. Now, for portraiture, um, if you have a very direct light, it can be a way to show uh, a dramaticness in a portrait. Now, this is a portrait of an artist working, and so I wanted it to be a little bit more dramatic. Um, now, you could see here there's this light coming in that was actually coming in from a door that was off to the side here. And because it wasn't directly coming in, the light was hitting the ground and then bouncing back in. You can see that you could still see the light, but it's not nearly doesn't have uh, as much a deline delineation as this light right here in the shadows. Oftentimes for portraiture, uh, people will choose a softer, diffused light. Now here are some photos of the exact same building around the same time of day, but in two different weather conditions. So this first one is a bright sunny day and the sun is shining straight onto the building, you can see here that the shadow is uh, delineated very well. Now here's the same building on an overcast day. If you look up here, um, there was a bunch of clouds that were filtering the sunlight through and scattering that around. So we still see shadow. There's still shadow right here. But on the door, it's not nearly as delineated as in this example right here, where bam, there's the shadow and there's where it ends. So the light is bouncing around the atmosphere and still lighting up our subject, uh, but there's a much different effect. Now for these photos, um, I had both, I had taken them both with the main focus being this razor fence here, right? Now if I wanted to 
if I wanted the point of thy photo to be the razor fence and how um, forceful it looks and maybe I mean a razor fence isn't a very happy thing the light up here I mean this feels bright and happy but if I am talking about the razor fence then this photo is probably something that I would choose more for the subject because it has a gloomier darker feel to it alright so here's another portrait example and this was taken on the same day right around the same time um, in fact this photo is taken with him sitting on these rocks back here now on this side you can see that there is a very bright light hitting him it was a bright day and there's shadow in his face over here okay so that is the direct light now I had him come into the water and turn towards me so the light was hitting behind him and so now we have to we have diffuse light because the light is actually hitting the water and bouncing around and hitting himself so we still have light hitting his face but it's very diffuse it's not direct light anymore and you can see how much of a difference it made in the portrait so the second part is direction where, where is the light hitting your subject is it coming from the side the front, the back, above, below. And here's an example I use with a little um, action figure of Jim Morrison, who if you guys don't know who Jim Morrison is, he's a singer from the 60s and 70s. <clears throat> and I want to show you the different ways that the light has hit him with some examples down here with the actual light source. And this is actually an example of what you can turn in as your first extra credit assignment on lighting directions. You can see there's seven images here. So some things about direction first off is that front lighting will flatten or de-emphasize texture because the shadow is behind the subject. And we can look at the hair to really see this. So here this is a front lighting which will de-emphasize texture and if you look at the hair here we can see there is some texture but if I flip forward a couple now you can really see the texture on the side lighting because there's more shadows being shown okay when it's front lighting the shadow there wasn't shadows able to be shown but now with the side lighting hitting from over here we can see more of the texture So backlighting can create a silhouette and or glow around your subject. And this is what I mean, a silhouette where you can just see the outline of your subject. And quick tip, which we'll talk about even more later on in our, when we talk about portraiture, is that flattering light for most portraits is going to be angled from about 45 degrees and 0 and 45 degrees from the front of the subject. So here are the setup shots for each of those. Okay, so here we have our front lighting. And if you see here, um, I used a lamp, just a regular old desk lamp. Now I have fancy photo equipment, but I wanted to kind of show you guys um, that you, know, you can use almost any light source for your extra credit assignment. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. Now I did use uh, one of my nicer cameras because I wanted to put it on a tripod so that every shot was essentially the same and you guys can just see the difference in the directions of light. But This isn't necessary. You can totally do this with your phone um, with any object. Alright, so you can see here that I have the lamp right above my camera similar to where a flash would be, like a pop-up flash and such and here's a straight down version of this alright so this is um, the light where the light is still in front of the subject so it's zero degrees zero degrees being straight on but I've tilted it up I've brought it up and this actually is going to emphasize cheekbones more this is a really popular type of lighting for glamour shots and fashion shots because they want to show um, women in that way. Uh, another thing to point out is this is uh, great lighting for people who have maybe some kind of 
textural skin flaws that you want to hide, such as wrinkles or acne, because again, this de-emphasizes texture, so that texture on the skin won't have shadows. If you try to have try to do side lighting with someone who is self-conscious about wrinkles, uh, they will not be your friend anymore because the side lighting will emphasize the texture of the wrinkle. So here now we have an angled light or what's also called a loop light in portraiture which is about 45 degrees. So if you think of this being zero degrees from uh, the camera to your subject and now we're more at a 45 degree angle. So for those of you who thought that math and geometry would never matter in everyday life, well it does. <laughs> so here's one example for photographers where it does. So at a 45 degree angle you have loop light. And loop light comes from the shadow that's being cast by the nose. It's a little loop here. Okay. If you move it over even just a bit more to a 30 degree angle, we now have Rembrandt lighting. And Rembrandt lighting comes from an artist who used to paint a lot of his portraitures with this type of lighting. And how you can tell it's Rembrandt is now that the light has gone more to the side and the shadow of the nose is now connecting to the shadow of the cheekbone, leaving the small little triangle of light on the cheek. That is classic Rembrandt lighting. So now we're here at our side lighting. And as you can see, I didn't really move the base, but I just kind of angled this straight to the side of my subject. And this usually creates a very dramatic effect for portraits. Um, like a yin and yang, <laughs> it can convey balance between the light side of a person and a dark side of a person. Next, we have low light, under lighting, which is also called monster lighting. And it comes, this term comes specifically from um, early monster films where they would purposely light the monster from below. And why this looks so weird and odd is because in everyday life, we do not see people this way. The sun is never lighting anybody from below. Um, it sets, we never see this. So it looks and feels very unnatural. And I wanted to include this because you know, at this point, the hands kind of obstruct what would be happening, and this isn't the greatest example to show you. But this is exactly what I mean by under lighting or monster lighting. And last but not least, we have backlighting. So backlighting is being your subject having being lit straight from behind. And uh, it creates a silhouette, like I said earlier. Now, if it's tilted a little bit higher, which I don't have an example here, um, it can give more of a glow or halo effect, which is really popular in photography, uh, especially with those sunset photos where the sun is behind the person and their hair is being hit by this glow. All right, so the third part of light is the amount. The amount of light has a huge impact on the settings that you and your camera can choose. So if the light is really low, and your shutter speed is getting so slow that maybe you can't even get um, a clear photo anymore. You have a lot of movement and you don't want movement in the photo. Your ISO has gone up, so there's a lot of grain. Well, the best solution is going to be to get somewhere where there's more light. Look around the room or where you're at and look for a light source. See if there's somewhere else that you can quickly move to to get better lighting. Uh, direct sunlight is really, really strong, but like I said, weather conditions such as um, a cloudy day or being in the shade even can really change the amount of light that you're getting, the amount. Indoor lights don't really put out nearly as much light as they seem. Our eyes will naturally adjust to low light when we go inside by dilating our pupils to let more light in, which is exactly what the aperture on your camera does. It gets larger to let more light in. And something just in general to think about is being aware of bright areas that are in your photos because they can pull the viewer's eye away from what you're really trying to show from your subject. 
So for your extra credit, um, basically just turn in seven images on Canvas of one of the objects, uh, one object with seven different lighting directions discussed.